Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and we are here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. And I am here this week with our special guests, Stuart Craner and Des Dearlove. They are the founders and leaders of Thinkers 50, which is an organization that ranks every two years the world's leading management thinkers. And we're going to be talking to them today about leadership trends for 2023, what they are seeing, what is happening out there in the business world that you need to be aware of so that we can all be better leaders, better professionals, and better people. Stuart and Des, welcome, gentlemen. Thank nice you very much. You, Always great to see you, Dorian. Thanks for inviting us on the show. Thank you so much. We're really glad to have you here. So first question out of the gate, you all just this week released your list of Thinkers 50 2023 radar thinkers. These are emerging thinkers that you believe have the potential in the future to, uh, to shape the world of business thinking. We'd love to hear a little bit more about this list. You know, how, how did you compile it? What does it mean to be a radar thinker? How, do, how does one make a mark such that they get noticed in this way? I'm going to kick this one to Stuart first, and then we'll, we'll alternate a bit. But Stuart, we'd love to hear your thoughts about who are these radar thinkers? Yep. So every year since 2016, uh, we've been selecting 30 thinkers who we think are 30 up and coming pe thinkers, people uh, that all the world of management should start paying attention to, ideally now. Uh, many of them have got books coming out this year. So this is kind of advanced warning from us. Uh, we got uh, 5,000 nominations for the uh, Thinkers 50 radar, but really we spend our life um, our sad and empty lives, perhaps, where we spend our lives talking to people and trying to find out who are the new people, who are the who are the next um, Adam Grants, uh, who's the next Dan Pink, who's the next Dor Dory Clark. We're, we're always asking, trying to figure out who's who's who the people. There's only who, one Dory Clark. Oh yeah, there's sorry, sorry, Dory sorry, sorry. The um, but we're always trying to figure out who who are the people worth listening to and worth worth reading, and that's really been the point of Thinkers Fifty from we started twenty odd years ago. And what we realized that the world was just full of conferences, books, articles, magazines at that time. And that was before the internet was really where people sought their information. A lot of stuff. And we've, we set out to kind of cut through, cut through the crap and get to the good stuff that people can read and to make people think and people, ideas that can be put to work. I think that's the, the thing we're always looking out for. We don't want kind of esoteric academic research, even though that, that, that's it, that's important. But we want research that, that helps people, helps managers, and helps helps the world. That's great. We're here with Stuart Craner. And in a moment, I'm going to turn to Des Dearlove. We're so excited to hear your perspective. We just want to say hi to everyone tuning in from around the world. So if you are tuning in, please type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you are tuning in from. And we are taking your questions for Stuart Craner and Des Dearlove. They're the heads of Thinkers 50, which ranks the world's leading business thinkers. Now, Des, I'm curious, Stuart was telling us about the Thinkers 50 radar thinkers that have just been unveiled, but I think our audience would love to get a sense of who some of these folks are. Now, obviously it's it's a you know list of, I believe maybe 30 people, is that right? Mm -hmm. So it's too many to name, but perhaps you could tell us a little bit about some emblematic folks and some of the interesting things that they're doing. I think the first thing to say is that, is that we, we, we want this list to be very eclectic it is deliberately very diverse and very eclectic so we we try to make it a very um broad church and we recognize too that that it's an opportunity really to draw attention to some of the new voices in management thinking um people who we hope that if we shine a bit of a spotlight on them um it'll give them an opportunity to really um, make strides in their in their careers Stuart, who comes to mind on the list that this time around. I like uh, Mark Vletter, a uh, Dutch entrepreneur, founder of a number of fast growing Dutch businesses. And all his businesses have the same edicts of no management. They're all self managed. They put holacracy uh, to work. Um, we will throw names at you. So uh, you can check out the thinkers50.com website, it gives you the full list of the radar and, and all the names and background on the people. Uh, I also like Neil Lewis from Cornell. Uh, mm -hmm. Neil's part of the Action Research Collaborative, which brings academics, practitioners, community members, and policymakers together 
to figure out solutions to problems that afflict the world. I think a lot of the, the people we feature this time and over recent years are about uh, tackling big issues. And I think that's the focus. That the focus has changed in the Thinkers 50. We used to fe feature Thinkers 20 years ago, and their focus was on, on, on improving shareholder value or producing more products, selling more products, very straightforward business challenges. But now a lot of the people uh, we feature want to change the world. And that's a huge difference, obviously. And but it's really important. It shows you the, the and I think it's true that the a lot of the issues afflicting the world could be a, could be changed by some of these ideas. Another good guy is pa Paolo Savage from Oxford, who's got a book coming coming out called The Four Workarounds: Strategies from the World's Scrappiest Organizations for Tackling Complex Problems. Re re really great stuff. Yeah, staying with Oxford, um, I mean, you you were asking, you posed the question, Dory, in your sort of teaser for the show about, you know, the way that leadership is changing and, you know, how we should reinterpret it. There's a guy called Edward Brooks, who's who's also based at Oxford, and his work is at the intersection of character, virtue and leadership. So this is kind of old, almost old fashioned. We're almost, you know, we're, we're, we're a nod back to Aristotle and some of those really old ideas about character and what it is to be a leader. It's not just about you know, what you actually deliver, it's about who you are, you know, and, and how you how you show up in the world. And I think that sort of work. So he's he's um, he's leading a, a project at Oxford, which is called the Oxford Character Project, a research project. So, you know, it's a real it's a real, as you can tell, it's a real mix. You would as you would imagine, too, there's a lot of digital stuff, a lot of you know people in AI and the, what we were talking just before we came on the metaverse. You know, it's a it's a it's a really diverse bunch of people. That's fantastic. We're here with Des Dearlove and Stuart Craner from Thinkers 50. We're talking leadership trends, and this is Dory Clark with Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. And we want to say hi to some of the great friends tuning in from around the world. Type your name into the chat box. Let us know who you are. Katie's here from New Jersey. We've got Christine joining. Carolyn's in North Carolina. Andrea's joining. Uh, Joshi, we want to say hi to Azite from Mozambique. Sandy's in Dublin. Uh, Zion is here from Cape Town. Zeke is in San Benito, Texas. Jen Jennifer's here from Wisconsin, Beth from London, Peter's back from Edinburgh, Khaled's in Riyadh, we've got Christine from uh, from the sky, and uh, Sushma's here from India. She says, this is the most crucial episode of Better so far. So we love having every single one of you. Thank you for being here. Now, I just want to pick up on a, a strand that you were talking about. Des, you mentioned a moment ago that there's a lot of development in, in tech, in metaverse, online things. And so one of the things that I'm curious about, and I'll, I'll route this one to, uh, to Stuart, is chat GPT. This is an area that has really interesting ramifications for thought leadership. Um, I, I have played around with it. And uh, the other day, I I even was uh, was sort of typing in about, you know, well, you know, what, you know, can you write something in the style of Dory Clark? And, you know, I'm like, hmm, how, how easy can I make this for myself? And chat GPT is no joke. This is, uh, this is very good. So what does thought leadership mean when a computer can be instantly synthesizing things? How do you, how do you think about that as, you know, I know, of course, that, that, idea creation, that the creation of intellectual property is a crucial part of uh, creating business thought leadership in the world. How do you reckon with this? Stuart, let's hear your perspective first. I was going to say, sorry, I'm sorry to cut you, but I, we must all be egotists, sorry, because I asked it exactly the same thing. I asked it to to write a chapter of, of a book in, in my style and um, it's scary, it's scary what it did. Seriously, I know. It, it, it may be better at being us than we are. <laughs> yeah. But I think our, our, our belief is that anything that helps people share ideas and collaborate uh, is 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 useful. And uh, I think the jury's out whether it helps people share ideas and collaborate. But um, I think that that's our the basic principle we uh, approach all technologies with. Um, I thought it was interesting too that um, the musician. I mean, you know, you you obviously have an interest in music, Dory, and and, and performance. The Nick Cave, the singer songwriter, you know, talking about the, the chat GPT thing said that the thing is what AI can't do is it, it hasn't experienced human pain. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it can't write in the way now, which I think there's something to that. I think it's interesting. 
um, before it before it replaces all of us creatives. But I also think that, that you know writers for years have imagined themselves in the shoes of others and 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 produced um, pieces of writing which aren't necessarily based on personal experience. So it's a very interesting time because I think we all thought that perhaps perhaps foolishly we thought that as writers and creators we were somehow safe <laughs> from this AI stuff at least for a while I think we thought that you know we, that, oh it can't replicate what we can do well it turns out and we've, we've done the experiments and anybody who hasn't tried it really should give it a go um, but it turns out it's it, and it's only just beginning so it's 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 fascinating will it will it replace thought leadership does it have to, will it be able to you know synthesize um, human thought and human concepts? Um, I'm sure it will have a good go. I was talking to someone this morning, and uh, he said uh, he was skeptical about the future, and particularly oh. particularly in relation to technology. And I don't think you can be skeptical about the future. It's not it's not a good route in life. So we've got to got we've got to think these are, there are positive forces at work. That's right. It's coming one way or another. So it's a, that's really interesting. Thank you, gentlemen. We just want to say hi to some of our great friends tuning in from around the world. If you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like and the share button so that your friends can benefit from it as well. Cheryl is tuning in from Minneapolis, St. Paul. Joshi's in Uganda. DT's in Rochester. Saying hi to Chelsea in Fort Worth and Allison in Toronto. Narish Kumar's in India and Monica's in Denmark. My man Franz is in Bonaire, Dutch Caribbean. John Lucas in London and Brooke is in Baltimore. Somewhere. We love having every single one of you. And a great question came in from Adnan. A lot of folks are probably wondering about this as well. I'm going to route this to you first, Des. Adnan says, what are the criteria when nominating uh, think people for Thinkers 50? If, if someone here is uh, a, a business thinker or an aspiring business thinker, uh, maybe this is something they dream of one day, is to be able to have the level of impact necessary to get it onto the, the Thinkers 50 list or the Thinkers 50 radar list. What are the things they should be thinking about or working on so that they can uh, be able to do that in the future we i mean we we actually produce four different lists of which the radar which as you rightly pointed out has, has just come out um this week in fact the radar list is out the radar list is is much kind of looser in the sense that we rely on the eyes and the ears of people who are in business but especially people who are already in the thinkers 50 community people tell us about the bright young things who are coming through because we simply can't you know can't monitor the entire world so, so that list is a bit looser and it's deliberately eclectic. We cast the net wide. We we want it to be, um, you know, we want we want to get as much um, different as many different nationalities and backgrounds as we possibly can. The ranking itself has ten criteria. So the ranking which we produce every two years and two thousand and twenty three is a Thinkers Fifty ranking year. So in November we will be producing um, or announcing the new ranking. So, so we think of it in terms of, if you like, two axes. So on the one side, you've got the viability of ideas. How, I mean, specifically how, how rigorously they're researched, how relevant they are to what's going on in business at the, at the time. The reach, we're really interested in, in how broad they are. Are they, you know, we don't, we don't particularly want to, um, we, we, like, we like research that covers multiple industries. Ideally, it's global as well. It's not just, you know, um, US based or, or China based or something. So we like it to have reach. Um, and then we, we like it to be robust as well. So, so that's on the one side, that's the viability. And then the other thing we try to gauge is the, the visibility axis. So there are, there are a bunch of things there. We try to measure the influence that people have. So that's in terms of you, you look at the number of citations that their piece of research gets, which used to be the kind of the old fashioned way of doing it. These days, of course, we have to look to social media. That's been one of the big changes. So the criteria continues to um, evolve as we go along. But the ranking is a much more kind of serious study, um, trying to understand who are who are the most influential people um, and, and how they've reached that position and, and what, they're, what they're doing next, because we do it every two years. So if you haven't done any research for a couple of years, um, you know, you're potentially vulnerable to be replaced by somebody else that's doing some good work. 
That's right. Well, that's really helpful. Thank you very much, Des. We're here with Stuart Craner and Des Dearlove. They are the founders of Thinkers 50, which ranks the world's top business thinkers. And I'm Dory Clark. This is our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. And we want to say hi to our amazing friends tuning in from around the world. Feel free to type your questions for Des and Stuart into the chat box. Larry's here from Chicago. We want to say hi to Yama in London. We have Brian from New Jersey, Yukon from uh, California. Uh, Jackie's joining from Maryland. We have a LinkedIn friend from Dallas. Stephanie's in Chicago. We have Mary from Katona, New York. And Rudy says, bonjour from France. We love having all of you. Now, Stuart, something I was curious about, I was lucky enough to participate in this uh, actually last month, uh, but I know that that there is an initiative that Thinkers 50 has done in partnership with MIM Business School in Kyiv. And you have been uh, helping uh, spread spread positive ideas uh, to help the people of Ukraine during their difficult time. Can you talk a little bit more about this collaboration and how that came about? Yeah, it's uh, uh, Ukraine's leading business school in, in Kyiv. Uh, obviously, their work has been uh, decimated by the, by, by the war. Um, so what they started was a weekly webinar. Uh, their view is that they need the best ideas in the world uh, to rebuild Ukraine after the war. Um, so they have a, a weekly weekly webinar where they invite people from throughout the world to to appear. Dory, as you say, you, you appeared. Philip Kotler was was on the, on the other week. Alex Osterbald. There's lots of people from the Thinkers Fifty community have uh, give, given their time and helped the cause, and they're also raising money to support female entrepreneurs in, in Ukraine trying to start businesses or rebuild businesses. Um, but what, what's really interesting there, I think, is that their commitment to ideas, they, they know that uh, for all the physical dec decimation, the horrors of wartime, in the end, ideas will be necessary to move the country, country forward. Uh, and their positivity is uh, in in incredible. I was talking to them yesterday. They invited me to Ukraine yesterday. And I must admit, there's not many occasions I get invited to war zones. Um, but they want to carry on as normal and, champ and champion ideas. So they're going to put on a physical event in Kyiv in September. And they're making the point that uh, ideas change the world for the, for the better. And I mean, in the broad sweep of history, that's true. And in the particular case of Ukraine, they, they want to harness ideas to uh, rebuild their, their, their country. That's really powerful. Thank you. We're here with Des Dearlove and Stuart Craner of Thinkers 50. This is Newsweek Weekly Interview Show Better. I'm Dory Clark. We want to say hi to CL tuning in from Miami, Florette from Dubai, Angeliques in Indianapolis. We have Alberto in Brazil, John from Atlanta, and Sarah from Yemen, Kimani from Kenya, and Jefferson from Brazil. We love having all of you type your questions for Stuart and Des into the chat box. And a great one came in. Des, I'd love to send this one your way uh, from Prashant. And Prashant wants to know, what is one old leadership trait that we all need to unlearn? You, you all are the masters of business and leadership trends. What are the things we need to clear out and get rid of? Yeah, interesting. Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna come, I'm gonna come around on that, that particular question. I mean, the question you posed in your when you invited us on the show was, you know, what's how is the how is the scope of leadership changing? And I think there's a good kind of segue from Stuart's point about Ukraine, because I think what's what's going on at the moment is we are being offered, if you like, th there's a polarization of of leadership in the, that we can see in the world. So, and, and in a way, the the war in the Ukraine absolutely illustrates that. I think it, it you know it perfectly illustrates that. On, on the one hand, you have a leader. Who, who's, let's say, using the old-fashioned command and control um, techniques, and then on the other side, you've got a leader who is all about um, building, um, creating collaboration, um, giving hope to his people, rallying, and again, not necessarily the leader we would have expected to step into that role. So it's it's a really interesting time. I think the less the thing to unlearn probably is this sense that there is a a way that leaders look and that leaders have to be decisive always and they have to be powerful, they have to be commanding. I think that, that, if you like, the heroic leadership myth 
we we don't need another hero. What we need is real people, I think. Um, and real people are heroes when they when they do the right thing. I think it's fascinating to um, hear people like somebody like Jacinda um, Ahern talk about what leadership means to her. Obviously, she's just stepped back from being prime minister of New Zealand, but she talked about being kind and strong. And I think leaders can be kind. They're, these things can go together. So we don't need to be, I think we could we could start to unlearn some of the lessons about being ruthlessly decisive and making decisions in, in you know, very rapidly. Sometimes actually taking the time to reflect, thinking about, think, thinking things through, being a bit kinder to the people that follow us. I think, I think there's something to be said for that. I think that's, that's the shape of leadership um, that I'd like to see anyway, moving forward. And I think, I think the, there are real signs that that's, that's coming through and, and perhaps the command and control leaders that we've seen in the last couple of years, um, perhaps we're moving away from that model. I think we have to unlearn the, our assumption that um, leadership is associated with age. So I'm, I'm a 60 year old white guy, therefore, I could, therefore I'm a leader. And I, I was kind of, why are our leaders older people? And the logic is because they've got more experience, mm. but having more experience in a world which no longer exists doesn't seem to be a great rec recommendation for someone to be a leader, as far as I can see. And what's, what's wrong with a 30-year-old CEO? The problem is not whether that person can do the job because they've, they've got the energy, certainly the, the intelligence to suggest that they can. But it, what stops 30-year-olds being CEOs is the attitude of other people. And, and that's what needs to be unlearned. So leadership should be aim, open to all. It's a really interesting point. Thank you. That's Stuart Craner. We're here with Stuart and Des Dearlove, and they are the founders of Thinkers 50. If you're enjoying this conversation and you want to never miss one, every week we are doing these Newsweek interview shows. Just go to doryclark.com. You can sign up for the news, the uh, email list there. You'll never miss an episode because you'll get messages and reminders. And if you want to learn more about the great work that Stuart and Des are doing at Thinkers 50, go to their website, thinkers50.com. You can join their email list so you'll be notified about upcoming events and things that you should know. We also want to say hi to great friends tuning in. Steven is here from Silicon Valley. We have a LinkedIn friend from Calgary. Miriam is in Malawi. We have Christopher here. We have Christine in Rochester. Petra's in Martinique. Uh, we have Tu Dong from Paris and Rita Marie is here from Ireland and Natasha Fatma from Paris. We love having all of you. And a question that I am curious about, gentlemen, is when you think about the best leaders that you personally know, people, people in your own life, you know, not, not necessarily a, you know, a Peter Drucker type figure, but, you know, maybe just a, a, a sort of regular leader that you have encountered, who stands out to you and why? Is there sort of a personal exemplar you turn to? I will open up the, the floor for either or both of you if there's someone that comes to mind. Uh, there's a guy called Henry Stewart, who, who is CEO of a company in London called Happy. And uh, Henry is a fantastic guy, huge amounts of energy and in integrity. And he gives people power. And he, every, every, decision, every decision is pre-approved. So people used to come to him and say, Henry, can I spend 500 pounds on this? He would say, no, it's pre-approved giving people uh, the power and the freedom to do things. And I think the best managers we've come across are people like, like that. We used to, there was a guy we worked with called Mark Sylvester, who was a really, really nice guy who sadly mm -hmm. died last year. And we used to go to meetings with him and he was the very senior guy in the room. And he, and he would sit there and he wouldn't say anything. And eventually we went to a few meetings. He didn't really contribute much. And we said, well, Mark, what's, why, why aren't you saying anything? He said, well, my people, <laughs> the people I work with, they're working on this project. I'll say something when I need to, but out of respect for them, when I don't need to, I won't. And I think there's not many managers and leaders have that, uh, somebody in the chat refers to authenticity, but kind of um, decency and respect for the other people. And when you see that, it really stands out. That's a great example, Stuart. Thank you very much. Des, do you want to weigh in on this at all? Uh, just with what Stuart was talking, it just reminded me of um, one of the one of our radar thinkers from last year, Madhupi Taylor Pierce, who's 
whose kind of mission is to develop leadership capability in Africa. And, and he's just written a piece and he said, leaders speak last and listen hardest. Because as soon as the leader speaks, it, 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 it skews the conversation. So leaders should have the be able to hold their tongue and actually listen to what's going on in them and be the be the last person to speak instead of the first person to speak. So he's he's um he's very impressive in that sense. I, I can point people towards Pia Lauritsen, who's on the radar this time, and she's founder of something called the Question Collective, uh, which is focused on creating um, creating a world where people are curious together. And I think the power of questions, which Pia her, her work is about also how how Gregerson at MIT, the power of questions is is, is really important kind of un, and still underrated I think. That's terrific. Thank you. A terrific question came in from Miriam, and she wants to know, gentlemen, what will differentiate a successful leader from an unsuccessful one in 2023 amidst all the transit transition and transformation that the world has experienced? Could you paint us a picture of? a successful versus an unsuccessful leader and what that might look like. Des, let me turn to you first with that question. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with my thesis about kindness and about, and about being strong, but being kind. I think it's about maintaining the humanity. I think one of the big changes that, that's going on that we see is once upon a time, leaders used to tell us that they had all the answers. And once upon a time, we maybe even believed that. But the world is changing so rapidly now that, it, that it's, 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 it's not even feasible that people can have all the answers. So I think what's coming through, we're beginning to understand that leaders are people who say, I don't have all the answers. Help me. I, I want to do the right thing. I want to I want to you know, I want people to come with me but I don't necessarily have all the answers and I'm not necessarily going to pretend that I have. So I think successful leaders this year will be people who, who understand and look, look into the eyes of the change and the, the fact, the uncertainty um, and embrace that to some extent, but also provide reassurance, a kind, but that does, as I say, it doesn't mean that they're not strong. If they make decisions when they need to make decisions. I think the people that will come unstuck, are people who still tell the world that they know the answers and that they know, you know, and we've, we've seen, we've seen one or two leaders who do that. I think, I think we know who we're thinking of. I think there's been an emphasis on solutions, getting quick solutions and no examination of the underlying problems. So I think the leaders who succeed in the future will be those who um, uh, don't follow instant quick solutions but get dig into what the underlying problem is and work with people uh, to understand the underlying problem and then tackle it. Rather than the quick fix. Yeah. Um, Those are great. Hopefully, hopefully followers have an appetite for a longer, you know, for people who are prepared to do that and not just look for a quick fix. Yeah, so I, th I think that's that's a really excellent point. We want to say hi to our amazing friends tuning in from around the world. Cameron's here from Rhode Island, Gianluca from London. We have Benaz from Iran, Christine from Hershey, Pennsylvania, Katya from Costa Rica, Cynthia's in LA, Immaculate is in Dubai, Dana's in Harrisburg, Sergio from Peru, Ahmad is here, Joao is here, uh, and Hussein is in Egypt. We love having all of you. Thank you for tuning in. And gentlemen, we have time perhaps for one more question. This one comes from Anna in New Hampshire, and she wants to know, what's the best way to assemble an eclectic blend of ideas into a single harmonized purpose? I can imagine that this might be especially true if you are a leader in a corporation, for instance, where there's a million things you're doing, your, your business has to you know, create projects, launch initiatives, everybody is doing their own thing, and yet somehow you have to create a sense of communal purpose. If you are a leader in today's society, how do you actually take all these disparate strands, strands and unite them into something meaningful? What would be your advice? I don't think you need to. Because I think, I, I, I think historically that's what we look to leaders for. One of the leaders uh, I admire and spent time with is uh, Jiang Raymin, who's a CEO of Hire, Chinese white goods company, biggest white goods company in the world. Uh, I've been to the company a few times. Des and I have both talked to Jiang, Jiang Raymin, really interesting philosophical guy. You try and figure out what's happening in this massive company. It's impossible. And that's not because of the Chinese culture that makes it difficult. But 
it, there's thousands of things happening. The people have got the freedom to set up their own businesses, take their own initiatives. So actually allowing the mess or what we would see as the mess. And that's why I found Paul, pa Paolo Savage, Savage's work about uh, scrappy organizations being willing as a leader to let all these um, flowers bloom is actually the big challenge of our times, not making them, not bringing them all, not necessarily bringing them all together. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think just as a final thing, um, Reed Hastings actually has just stood down or is standing down from CEO of Netflix and was obviously the co-founder of Netflix. We spent some time with him and, and his, the, the, the culture at Netflix is very much, you do not, you, you do what you want to do. You don't have to please your boss. You, you make you place your own bets. Um, they trust people to make their own decisions. In fact, that you know, if you if you can't handle making your own decisions and you're you're looking to pass the buck up, you're not going to fit in at Netflix. I'm not saying they've got everything perfect, but it's that same thing. It's it's trusting people and and allowing the organisation to be messy in order to be creative. So interesting. Really great points here. This is Dory Clark with Newsweek's weekly interview show, Better. We've been speaking with Des Love and Stuart Craner. They're the founders of Thinkers 50. If you want to learn more about the organization and the work they do, check them out at thinkers50.com. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. And Des and Stuart, thank you both for being here. Our pleasure, Dory. Really nice to speak to you. Thank you all and see you next week.